Well, the, the role was to give the force commander, because in or the first tour, the boss, as far as the UN peacekeepers were concerned, was the force commander. In my case, the particular one, the first one was a Canadian general, and he was replaced by an Irish general. Um, so, I, to give the force commander a non-military option for whatever might occur, and also to conduct the investigations on behalf of the UN for anything that happened within the buffer zone between the Greeks and the Turks. There was, let's be honest, the majority of both sides would have been quite happy for reunification. But there was an element on the south and an element on the north, very strong elements, that said, no, if you, you put us together, we'll start killing people again. Um, on the south, it was actually pretty well led by the Greek Orthodox Church. The UN were invited to send people down to the launching of, well, actually, no, not the UN, Australian police were invited by the Greek Cypriot police to send people down for the launch of uh, new patrol boats that they had. Um, when the British Army officer there, who I got to know who was in intelligence, said, now sat down with me for half an hour to brief me on what he wanted from what my observations of these boats. <laughs> but uh, when I got there, I did, we were just standing around there, no hat on, no anything, and the uh, Archbishop walked past and shook my hand and said welcome and I uh, put the beret back on for the ceremony and when he come back he saw it and he just looked at me and the change in his face was enormous and he just turned and walked right away from me, would not come near anybody from the UN. Right. But I did get a very good description of the police boats for the uh, <laughs> British military. The contingents then were 20. Um, we had a commander and it was Harry Bryant was our commander. He had three superintendents and 16 troops. Um, and we in that stage looked after sectors one, two and three and the Swedes were in sector four. Um, so you literally work separately except for major events when you could pull people together to um, assist each other. Working with the Swedes was good, very good. The Swedes were, were pretty well up front and, and, and all prepared to work. But the interesting thing was I, I learned from there, and that was the start of my learning of CivPol in the UN, um, more than half of them had never actually been a police officer. They were, because the police in Sweden include the people that sit at the border, immigration control at the borders, and that's all they did. Um, so there were a lot of people within the CivPol there, well, so some there and later a lot more in, in different other places where they really weren't police as we know the police. And so you start to get the understanding that you know, you've really got to work hard to <coughs> figure out how this all works. But they were easy to work with. We got on well and um, yeah, didn't, no problems whatsoever. They, they shaped their own deployment in their own area. Um, <coughs> but every time we tasked them, to come with us because we had a major event that needed everybody, not a problem. They came, they were prepared and they worked well yeah, without a problem. But um, the interesting thing when I first arrived, the thing that struck me first about Cyprus was the number of gum trees and wattle trees that were there everywhere you went. Driving from the airport to up to where we were, we were to live was gum trees and wattle trees. They were introduced by a British uh, Governor General somewhere in the 30s okay. because uh, he looked, he'd been to Australia and he, the trees in Cyprus had all been um, knocked down years, centuries before and he said, I know what will grow here quickly and he introduced them from Australia. There was a big change for the second tour a lot of change, but probably the first one, just to concentrate on that a little bit, in that that was a perfect opportunity for me to learn how the UN works. Because you could pick up the diary for any year preceding the one you're in, flick to the page and you'd find what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, because the same things happen. The severity of them varied, uh, but the two main events that caused this problem were the hunting season, a small, uh, well, Small game and 
Big game. Now, big game is rabbit in Cyprus. And the other, the, the three, two demonstration seasons. Now, each of those is about six weeks. So you've got roughly 24, eight, somewhere between 18 and 24 weeks of the year where there is a lot of problems and you've just got to meet them. Some years it's not too bad. Uh, some years the demonstrations get worse. Um, I mean, after I left, there was people shot with demonstrations. Um, one of our problems at the hunting season this year, because all the Greeks wanted to go and hunt in the buffer zone. Traditionally, that's where we go every year to hunt. Well, they never used to, but anyhow, because they couldn't go in, they went in. And we ran into um, one group in the middle of the buffer zone and I was there with uh, one of our patrols. And it, I knew the boat that was leading the hunters. He was one of the senior Cyprus police officers. And one of them fired the shotgun over heads a couple of times. And that's when the British section that were behind us came up and stood in front of us. And they decided to go home. But he had with him the first secretary of the Russian embassy, or the, yeah, it was the Russian embassy then, uh, was taking him hunting. And it was embarrassed he was being ordered out of the buffer zone. So that was the sort of thing you run. The demonstrations were, you know, sometimes they were violent, yes. Um, but the secret was, if it looks like turning really bad, get behind the barbed wire and shut the gate. It's that simple. There was a, a three or four week small game hunting season. That's when they went out and shot birds, tiny little birds. And then the big game was another three or four weeks, about, oh, about a month after the first one. Now, second time I was there, that had been condensed to one six week period for the hunting season, full stop. <clears throat> but they, um, there'd been a change and they weren't worried about the buffer zone then because they'd been banned from hunting in the national park because some of them had been shooting the mouflon, which is a sort of a goat, cross goat, mountain goat, um, but it would become endangered. So now they were in there trying to hunt in there. Weekends, there are a lot more, but even during the week when they're normally working, they, they were out there hunting. Um, you, you get two or three groups of four or five with their dogs. Uh, but on weekends, you could have up to, across the length of the buffer zone, you could add up to 30 or 40 different groups in there. North is Turkish, Turkish. and the south is Greek. Um, the area in between can be as narrow as 11 metres and as wide as uh, 11 kilometres. And basically it was where the troops stopped um, when the uh, armist well, a ceasefire was called. Technically they're still fighting. Um, and they're both sides have got um, troops along the, the edge. The 11 metres is in the, in the centre of Nicosia, the, what used to be the capital, well it is the capital city for both sides. And uh, you've got a, a road that runs through there and you know, buildings on one side of Greek Cypriot, buildings on the other side of Turkish Cypriot. And they used to poke bayonets each other on long poles at different times. There, there are three main points. The uh, Ledra Palace crossing point, which is in the centre of Nicosia. Um, a place called the Box Factory, which used to be an, an, old, <coughs> an old box factory and, and it was now... That was at that stage was a British Army base, and that was a, another major crossing point. And down at the other end, in the Swedish end, there was a little town called Pila, which was actually inside the buffer zone, and, and it was a town with both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots living in it. Uh, and that they were the three main. Or and the fourth one was right down on the coast at the eastern end, um, Verosha, where you had this what would have been a magnificent city in its day, a tour, the major tourist resort. Um, and the Greeks had evacuated from it back to a, a point, but the Turks didn't advance. And so, but it was then said, no, it can't be touched. And so the, I mean, the patrol through that area, you got the hotels just falling apart. And there was one hotel that was owned by a German company that they got permission to go in every year. 
and renovate and make sure the building, because they figured they were going to come back at some stage. At Ledra Palace it was easy because you had barbed wire leading down and you had a big fence that you could shut off, a big gate that could be shut off. So there, if, if they looked like it and out of hand, you just pull back behind the gate, shut it, and that was it. Uh, the box factory, no, they, they run around you, but you had to be careful because there are, land, there are minefields there, plenty of them. But you tend to notice that if they got around you and started running towards the Turks, after a little while they would slow down and they'd be looking over their shoulders as if to say, well, when are you going to stop us? Because the next line was the Turkish army. Uh, none of them actually wanted to run into the Turkish army. So um, with our, the ones we had, there were no real problems because nobody actually tried to get all the way across, which happened at a few years later with one of the other groups. But yeah, so, um, but we had a couple of ones where they, they got a bit nasty at Ledra um, and tried to, their aim was to try and hurt the UN uh, people. Uh, they definitely didn't want to get in amongst the Turks. But um, second tour, the demonstrations had eased a bit. First tour, you would not see underwear on display in any shop of any kind. Um, you walk in any shopping centre and there was always, a, in, on the Greek Cypriot side, you would always see a, a priest walking around, looking at, making, making sure they were following the rules and behaving themselves. Um, you could see the power that the church held over the south. Um, Second tour, the whole place had changed. Uh, there, were, there was um, no, you hardly ever saw the priests. There were still plenty of churches there, but you hardly ever saw the priests out in, in public. Um, shopping was completely different. The, the behaviour of the youngsters, young ones, was different. Um, interesting, the, the population had almost doubled in 10 years. Now, on the north, a lot of that was expat. Brits or expat Germans, and they built three universities there. And they were universities for basically the, the various Muslim countries in the Middle East. That's where the students come. So they were, each university held 20,000 students. Now, that, they just hadn't been there 10 years before. In the south, in Limassol, you had a lot of Russian expats and in Paphos, a lot of British expats. Um, basically, Limassol was a Russian town and uh, they were there. There was, a, well, there was a lot of trouble in Limassol, cars getting blown up, people getting shot now and then. Um, it was the Greek Cypriot Mafia and the Russian Mafia trying to control the port because through that port went a lot of uh, ships would come in there, not unload or anything, would get new paperwork and sail. Um, there was a lot of, yeah, a lot of the money coming into Cyprus, southern Cyprus was um, ships of convenience or flags of convenience, offshore banking were like, we met two Aussies there um, that were there. They were the head office of such and such bank. I can't remember which one it was now, but they were just there as figureheads and to say that the head office was there. They were paid for basically doing not much at all. Um, and, but they paid a lot less tax there than they paid anywhere else. But the port was well and truly in Greek Cypriot side, uh, nowhere near the buffer zone, no, nowhere where it's, we had no, uh, some, well, what we did have in some areas living in the south, you had pockets of Turkish Cypriots that were still there. Same as in the north, there were pockets of Greek Cypriots still living there. So we used to go and visit them weekly uh, to make sure that they weren't being harassed or, or whatever. With the ones in the north, I mean, we'd take food up to them from the south and, and next thing you know, you'd find them coming back through and delivering the food, selling it in the markets down south. But you know, they didn't really need it, but it was a thing they wanted to do. Um, we, we did the, the, uh, with the, the, the military provided the vehicles uh, and we always sent people along to um, just to talk to the local police and keep it calm if anybody was going to get upset and to, to do the checking to make sure they were all right and nothing was being done to hurt them. The one crossing point that was there, of, well, the, at Pila, they could go backwards and forwards from, the Greek Cypriots could come into Pila, the village of Pila and go back out 
Turkish Cypriots could come in and go back out. Now, some of the Turkish Cypriots actually went through because they were being employed, in the, particularly in the peak tourist season, because they were cheap labour. Um, at Ledra Palace, um, what could go backwards and forwards were the Armenians. There was an Armenian community, mainly in the north, but they travelled backwards and forwards, and both sides allowed it. They just had to check in. That was first tour. While I was there, the, the second tour had all changed. Um, not only was the place bigger and, and, and the roads were, were tremendously better, because the Turks started, they built a, a four-lane road, but it was mainly designed to be an airstrip in case they needed it. So when the Greeks saw it, they built one, and then they built more, and yeah. So it was, um, but the uh, second tour, it, it, it had changed, and then the, well, to start with, we, the general was no longer the boss. We now had a chief of mission, a civilian. So um, all of a sudden, little issues weren't as easy to resolve as they used to be. Like uh, one example, on the first tour, the, one of the things, jobs of the military was to make sure no fortifications were moved forward at all or had extra fortification put on them. They could replace what was there, but not add to it. Um, there was one in the Canadian area where they started to dig a trench, just a slit trench, but it was five feet forward from the line. So the um, Canadian uh, battalion sent a section up there and told them to move it back and they didn't. So all of a sudden they had a platoon of um, Greek Cypriot National Guard there confronting the Canadians. So the Canadians sent a platoon and, and gradually built up. So we eventually had a battle battalion with a couple of tanks on the Greek Cypriot side and the armour personnel carriers on the um, UN side facing off each other. Now, but the one thing that was happening at night, all the Greek Cypriots National Guard went home and they came back next morning. So on one particular night, the general and the battalion commander said, put a bulldozer in, fill it in. And they did. Come back next time. Wasn't, oh, okay. All over. That was it. Second tour, a similar thing in a, a slightly different area, but a similar thing. The, the Turkish, this time the Turks trying to move forward. And no, you can't confront because we're now run by a politician uh, or a diplomat. It, uh, no, we, we will negotiate. Well, when I'd left about five months later, the damn thing was still there and they'd actually moved it forward even further. Um, now, fortunately, it was in an area where the Greek Cypriots couldn't see it because it was only up against a UN post. But, uh, I mean, if the Greek Cypriots had known that they'd moved forward, there would have been a lot to hell raised. But getting a decision out of a politician diplomat was not easy. So things had changed in that respect. We ate out a lot. Um, you, you went to um, the Greek restaurants, you went to Turkish restaurants. There's not much difference between Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot. In fact, I heard somebody said, in fact, when you, somebody had done the DNA and said that they are actually closer together than the Turkish Cypriots are to Turks or the Greek Cypriots are to, to Greeks. Um, and they, they, yeah, they, you went to the restaurant, the restaurants were there. You, I mean, the first tour, the Turkish army that was there, the soldiers were never allowed to take their uniform off. Um, so when I, if ever I went north, I'd be doing a lot of saluting when I was in uniform because they recognised the Australian officers immediately and we, we had an, an excellent reputation with them. Um, and, and it went back, obviously goes right back to Gallipoli. But yeah, so yeah, I, I remember one time I was taking a carton of Victorian bitter to our jeweller on the north, who, who was an Australian, who well, Turkish Australian, he'd gone back there, and he, uh, and he, he asked me if, because we'd got some imported, and he said, yeah, what, what can you do? And I said, well, yeah, I can sell you one. So I sold him one. Um, but carry, I'm trying to carry a cart and a beer and salute the Turkish soldiers all at the same time. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it was, it was good. It, we had good relationships everywhere. The best thing was, the first tour was even better, was getting out in the little villages. On both sides, it was great. Second tour, because the whole 
countries, both sides had changed. I mean, you had all the, the, the students in the north and, and you had, well, the little villages in the south had now become just dormitory room suburbs for the cities. Um, you, you didn't get the little villages running like they used to before. It was a, but they become you know, sort of just dormitory and people migrated from there to work in the cities each day. The, the political side on the second tour was something, you had a, a, an independent UN group of politicians who were doing the negotiating with both sides, trying to come up with a solution, which didn't, wasn't happening at all on the first tour. I mean, it was just sit there, it's rolling along, nobody's killing each other. So, so the missions, it's meeting, it's nobody's, war hasn't started again, so we're meeting our um, mission statement. Um, but second tour, they're trying, and, and I know, I heard them say, well, the message came, well, the, the, they're flying the um, Secretary General in because they've told him that all he's got to do is turn up and both sides will sign the peace agreement and open the borders. And I looked at him and I said, who said that? They said, well, the people up there in the UN, whatever it is, I said, it's not going to happen. Yep, okay, yep, it's going to happen. So we, we had the Secretary General flying in. Now all we had, he will be arriving at this time on this flight. There will be negotiations. He'll be here four days and he'll be leaving. Nothing else. Plan. Yeah, right. Okay, so we planned the route to get him from the airport to where he was staying and, and Saipol uh, secured that route and... Um, cleaned out, did all the bomb checks of everything that was dangerous. But for the rest of it, we thought, well, we don't know where he's going to go, so how is anybody going to know where he's going to go? So we don't have to worry about checking for bombs on routes or anything, because we don't know. The only thing is we got his armoured vehicle was the number three vehicle for the president of Greek Cypriots. And one of my guys got to be the driver, and he said, if ever somebody stopped in a hurry in front of us, we were going to hit them, because that thing's brakes were bloody woeful. <laughs> But um, he came in and we got them all. Now, the first day to the first day of the conference, the Secretary General drove into the compound with his 17-vehicle convoy. The Turkish Cypriot President Dengtash drove in with his 17-vehicle convoy. The Greek Cypriot President drove in with his 17-vehicle convoy. And the past President from the Greek Cypriot drove in with his 11 Cypriot convoy. Now then, they're all going to the Chief of Mission's house for lunch. So I'm sitting down there with a the British major and we're trying to figure out how we're going to get these convoys from there and into here, in, which is a very narrow turnaround, not enough room for five vehicles, never mind 17. And we're, so we almost come up with an idea and the, the young corporal there said, excuse me, sirs, I wouldn't worry about that. What? Now it's got to be... Sirs, look at the television. And there was the Greek, the Turkish Cypriot president and his convoy leaving and going back to, to, to north. Uh, immediately followed by the Greek Cypriot president heading south. It was over. 40 minutes in of what was supposed to be three days of negotiations and they both refused to comply or cooperate in any way whatsoever. And it was finished. <laughs> But I got to meet the <laughs> the, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations and he shook our hands and thanked us and I got to push a few journalists around who were thought like the Greek, especially the Greek Cypriots, they thought they ruled the roost there. Uh, no, not we're not, you're not getting closer to my boss. Um, there was one, one Australian, a, a farmer went in um, drove his tractor in and he, he hit a mine into his farming field in, in the buffer zone. Because there was, we, we were always trying to get farming back into the buffer zones so we could try and normalise that whole stretch. Um, and it was definitely, the patrol track was the dividing line. South of the patrol track, the Greeks could farm. North of the patrol track, the Turks could farm. Turks, first tour, no way. They just did not allow it. Uh, the Greeks allowed some. But yeah, now this, this had been all a few years before and um, 
it, he, an Australian, walked, went in, got him out and brought him back out. Um, there was uh, one UN Land Rover, was one of our UN Land Rovers from the earlier times, drove over a mine. Um, because they, they were in the early days where nobody really knew where they all were. By the time we'd got there, everybody knew where they were, they were well marked, and so you, you didn't worry about too much about the mines. I mean, you had barbecues sort of 10 metres from the minefield, but um, they, they, were, they were so well marked. And, the, and yeah, everybody knew where they were. So, but they had, there had been troubles in the past. Just on the first tour, the Anzac Day, in the middle of the buffer zone is a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery with five Australian stroke Kiwis, all airmen buried there. So Anzac Day, we have a dawn service there. The UN in Cyprus allowed each country, each nation to, you had so many public holidays for everybody, but then each nation could have three of their own. So we had Anzac Day, Australia Day and Melbourne Cup Day as our public holidays. Um, and every year there was a service at the cemetery, a dawn service there. And then you go back to the mess, gunfire breakfast, um, with all the dignitaries and everybody invited, and then we'd have a party in the afternoon. Uh, and the, the first tour, when we got there, standing on the berm behind the cemetery were Turkish soldiers in uniform standing there at attention and at the right times they presented arms and it was just awesome to see that. On the first tour, we were, my first demonstration when I was working that, I went and sat down and chatted to the Greek Cypriot who was running their side of it and we got talking and, and he, said, he said, oh, he'd just been promoted to be the officer in charge of traffic for Nicosia. And I said, yeah, he said, I, I hear in Australia you have traffic campaigns. I said, yes. He said, oh, what do you do? So I started explaining how you organise and run a traffic campaign, media and all that. And then I got to the hard part. I said, then you go out and you enforce the law. And he looked at me. On everybody? I said, yep. If you pick that particular thing, no matter what it was, you go out and you book everybody that breaks that particular law. What if they have a relative who is a senior police officer or a member of parliament or one of the priests or <laughs> you enforce the law? Oh, well, it was a good idea. <laughs> Put it aside. Not going to be done. Um, it was just, I mean, they, they were killing more on the roads than we were in Australia. And the population was only, at that stage, was only 360,000. Um, and it's just, that's an act of God. So, yeah, road safety was your biggest problem, and as far as I was concerned, both tours. Habibi said you can have a vote for independence, and the UN was invited to run it, and it was actually run by the UN. The ballot complete from start to finish was run by the UN. Um, the Australian Electoral Commission provided all the electoral material. You had... <coughs> Uh, 247 UN police, as they are now called, not CIFPOL, from all over the world. Um, I had with me, there was uh, Spanish, Brazilians, Senegalese, Malays, Pakistanis, Australians, Kiwis. I keep forgetting the last one. But yeah, eight, eight different nations in, in uh, 24 odd police. Um, oh, Americans were the last one, yeah. Now, um, I was in at the Emir Regency. I remember when we arrived, well, we flew in in th three groups, the Australians. The Australian contingent was 50. Um, there were three groups through, flown, flown in one week apart so that it didn't look like it was an all-Australian operation. Um, you had um, mi mingled in with a bunch of others all the time. Now, I was on the last group to fly in. We flew in, um, I met the commissioner, <coughs> and he told me where I was going. He said, you'll be going to the Regency District of Amira, and I'll be the boss. He said, but I'll probably have to replace you later on with one of the South American contingent commanders that will be coming in, because they're coming in with large contingents. 
yep, not a problem. I can do whatever job you give me. Um, the funny thing was we were then supposed to, the, I mean, we arrived one morning uh, in the morning. Um, we were supposed to get a convoy of six vehicles each, three different groups of six, to go to your three different areas. Well, two of the convoys turned up and headed off, and two vehicles of my six turned up. And I talked to the drivers, oh, yeah, well, the other four turned out and went a different direction. I thought, right now, there's four vehicles the UN will never see again. So we're sitting there, and eventually we got, we didn't know what we were going to do, but we eventually said, right, let's go and load up. Uh, somebody came in with a, a minivan, and we loaded that, used that to put some stuff in, and we went down and filled up whatever we could from the store. Met um, JJ, was a British storeman who ran the place, excellent guy. Turned a blind eye while we stole him blind, robbed him blind, because um, he, he, he just believed, I don't need it in here, I need to get it out. Then we drove to the um, Polary headquarters there, uh, into the, uh, and I walked into the ops operations room and uh, was met by a liaison officer. And he said, well, they're busy, so sit down. So we sat down and we're just having a coffee. Me and him, well, we actually had two. And I could listen, there was two Australian officers in there and um, some of the, the Indonesian senior officers and it was just pure accusing each other of everything and there was no attempt to compromise from either side and it was just a damn mess. And anyhow, then they stormed out and everyone said hello to me, but that's okay. We, we finished my coffee and this young fellow went over and next, you know, the two officers come down and there's another coffee and we're sitting down to him and said, look, I'm sorry, I'm late. Um, told them the story about the vehicles and they said, oh, that's never, yeah, you'll never, we all agreed I'd never see those four vehicles again. Uh, right up. so what are we going to do? I said, well, and I asked, I said, well, what do you suggest? Um, do you, what, or what do I need to fill in to get an escort for tomorrow to go, go in up to where I want to and um, where do you suggest I put my people up for the night? And he said, oh, he was the head of the Bremob in... Um, East Timor, he said, ah, I will be your escort and we'll go now. And it was just a simple matter. And this is where stuff from the training team and working with people really came to, was excellent. So he, he became our escort and we drove to Glenna. Um, and uh, when we got there, there were the other four vehicles already there. We learned, to, learned something. They thought that the two I had were ones they'd never see again. It was something we learned about the Timis. They might try and kill you, but they wouldn't steal from you. <laughs> it was <coughs> amazing. The, the, the UN police job, the, the um, mission statement was to advise the Indonesian police and protect the ballot boxes. Um, that was our job. <coughs> now, uh, I stretched both. If I didn't know what was going on, how could I give advice? So I could send people out to investigate different things that were reported to us. If we didn't protect the ballot process, how could we protect the ballot boxes? And <clears throat> I got on, well, the, the f first person I met and sat down and talked to was the local um, TNI battalion commander. Um, and basically his main theme early in that conversation was I'm wearing all my ribbons because the army guys that did our, helped us with our training said one thing with the Indonesians make sure you wear your ribbons they know what every one of them means and make sure as a senior officer you look good each day so I did always and he's really quizzy, are you really a police officer or are you a soldier that's in disguise? And I've, eventually I was able to convince him. Um, we actually spoke many times later on. It was interesting, one of his conversations, in that conversation he came, he said, you will probably, being a Vietnam veteran, <coughs> you will understand how I feel if we get forced to pull out of here. He said, you lost people in Vietnam and I'm sure you lost friends. And I said, yes. And, and he said, well, I've lost friends here. And if we pull out, then I've lost them for nothing. Uh, and it was an interesting statement. Um, there were threats 
I mean, every time we went to a different village, you could guarantee within 48 hours, something would arrive at, at our base saying, you return there and you will be killed. That was, uh, one time, it was actually a typed letter just found on the desk inside the office. Nobody knows. Another time it was a young kid came in with a written note. So different ways of getting to us. Um, and I implemented a policy, the minute there was a threat, the very next day we would be in that village. Now it could be myself, and a, or a patrol, or the UN uh, military liaison officers we had with us, which was, initially it was a Malay lieutenant colonel and an Irish major, and it was, we were eventually, and they were joined not long after that by a Russian naval officer, Yuri, top fella. The three of them were good. Now, on the day after a threat was received, at least two of those three would turn up in that village every day. And then the next day we would go back again, and a couple of times. And then this was our way of saying, well, you know, have a go. But really what I was expecting was they wouldn't do a damn thing and we would put a bit of spirit into the village. Um, I personally adopted a, a policy of I would be out and about and seen as much as I possibly could. So if you want to make a target, and, and this is a decision I made personally and I never told anybody, um, and it's, it's in the book. If you want to make a target of my people, no, you don't want my people. I'm the target. Um, and, and it was, often I would come back and my counterpart who I got to know and we became, we, we became friends. Let's be honest with you, we were friends. He would abuse me and carry on because you've been out without your escort again. Because he always, he had told me, he said, oh, never go without an escort. Well, sometimes I did, I had to. But I had one where I was out with the escort where we were fired at. Um, so yeah, but, and that, that was, there were all sorts of little things all the way through. I mean, I know one, one night in, in Glenow, in the village, well, little town, every night there were three militia posts set up, one at each, four, one at each of the three major entrances and one in the centre of town. Now, when I was going from the office to the house I lived in, I had to drive past that one. And one I said, well, stuff it. Pulled up, got out and walked up very slowly, didn't rush. And they all grabbed their, all they had was the handmade guns, the home, homemade guns. And they were looking at me and we got talking and one of them could, she had a basic of English. So we could, said, well, I'll come back. And the next time I stopped, there was a bloke there who spoke English. Um, and I got a lot of information from them about what the militia was. Um, basically, there was a hardcore group who believed that they should remain part of Indonesia. There was another group that had family that were split across the border between East and West Timor. And they didn't want independence for East Timor yet. They wanted independence for Timor. There was a biggest group were just there because it was the safest thing to do. You, as long as you remember you weren't, and your family wasn't going to get based up. And then there was the worst group and the smallest group, they were just criminals. This was an opportunity to get away with whatever they wanted to get away with. Um, and, and at one stage talking with Fallentil leaders, because I got to know them quite well, the, he told me that they'd protected 60 of their members for 18 months because the Indonesians wanted them because they had actually been in and killed 19 villages. And as soon as the militia were up and running, and they'd switched sides and gone and joined the militia because they figured that was the safest place to be. And he said, they will kill at the drop of a hat. Um, and they were more frightened of them. And they, they'd had to completely change all their bases and everything because they went across. Um, so they were there all the time. Um, on the ballot day, um, well, the day before, one of my outposts was uh, was attacked at uh, about 11.30 at night. And they, they were firing automatic weapon fire into the roof of their house, um, or just about, right up to about 2.30 in the morning. Um, what they were, and I found out later, when I went back 20 years after, and. and I met a bunch of people and, and amongst two, two fellas came up to me there and said, Mr. Jeff, 
you don't remember us? And I said, no. <laughs> said, but we were part of the militia. Oh, right. He said, we were, I, and one of them said, I was in at Sabi when we started shooting at, at your people there on the night before the ballot. Why didn't they run? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they were supposed to run to you and then you were all supposed to evacuate and go to Dili and that would have been the end of the ballot. I said, you ran into some Australians, didn't you? Hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs>
and there was enough for about half a can of beer each. And one of the boys they said, boss, relax. You got us here. We're alive. Somebody else is making the decisions now. Last thing I remember. The next thing I remember is I'm waking up and I looked up and I thought I'm in, in, inside of a C-130 and I'm on a stretcher. And I sat up and, and uh, had a drip in. He sat up and the, um, the load master was there and he, I said, how did I get here? He said, lay down, mate. You're 10 minutes from Darwin. Uh, the last five days, we, because there was no food available in the town, so the town was empty. We each had four days Australian rations. I used two of them. Um, after about 70 plus hours of no sleep, it was about two hours a day. Um, so, yeah, just the body just said, you know, as soon as it's, hey, somebody else is doing it, bang, and apparently they flew me to the, the airfield in a helicopter. 